Howdy y'all and welcome to video 4.2.5 uh, for the legal studies guy. Um, just quickly before we start today, um, just for any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander viewers, um, just letting you know that uh, this uh, video today and this presentation does contain images of um, deceased persons um, in relation to a picture just where we're looking at the Mabo case, so just a little heads up on that one. Um, our quote today, be the reason someone smiles today. Um, bring a bit of extra joy into the world, so that's everyone's homework after watching this, is bring a bit more joy um, into someone's life today. So 4.2.5, the question we're going to answer today surrounds the relationship between courts and parliament in law making. So um, obviously we understand the relationship through the separation of powers um, in area 4.1 where the primary role of the courts is to resolve disputes um, that arise under laws made by parliament. Um, so in terms of their relationship in lawmaking, as we've looked at the fact that the courts, um, you know, develop precedent and interpret statutes, etc., cetera, um, we're looking at this list of five things. So the supremacy of parliament, the ability of courts to influence parliament, uh, the interpretation of statutes by courts, codification and abrogation, which go hand in hand together. So these five things kind of all interweave with each other. Um, and we'll basically just talk our way through the five um, and then look at a sample question from an old VCAR exam as we look at what in this context the word analyse means. The essential question though is, what is the relationship between parliament and the courts in lawmaking? And the first one on that list is the supremacy of parliament. Um, and this is just, simple concept and a lot of what they've done on past legal studies exams around the relationship between courts and parliament is basically give you a scenario um, and ask you to explain whether it's correct or not or find the errors in this scenario and a lot of that centers on the idea that you need to understand that parliament is the supreme lawmaking body in its jurisdiction so whatever parliament is given power over it is the supreme lawmaking body in those areas. Um, that means it can override the courts. Um, so if the courts rule on an area of law and create a new precedent, and Parliament thinks that that shouldn't apply in society, Parliament can make a law that um, overrules that precedent. It doesn't change the decision in that case, but it would for future cases. Um, the only exception is constitutional matters. So interpretations by the High Court of the Australian Constitution can potentially override Parliament, decisions made by Parliament, because we know that the High Court has to act as the guardian of the Constitution. Um, so that is probably the only, only example of where um, the courts do have some superiority, I suppose. But when it comes to um, generally lawmaking, Parliament is the supreme lawmaking body and has supremacy over the courts. Um, one of the big features of the relationship between Parliament and the courts is uh, all of 4.2.3, which is interpretation of statute, statutory interpretation. Um, so as we know, often Parliament's laws are drafted to cover broad areas. As a result, courts need to interpret uh, different aspects of the law so they can apply it to the specific fact situation of a case. Um, and then this develops um, the law further. So. We looked at examples like in the Tasmanian Dams case, it actually took a term external affairs and gave it a really broad definition. So actually it made the definition broader and made the law broader or that area of law broader. But interpretation by courts can also narrow it. So the Studded Belt case um, where, where the, uh, the offender was charged and convicted of carrying a regulated weapon because he was wearing a studded belt. Um, in this case, the court's interpretation was that um, a weapon is only something whose primary purpose is to be used as a weapon, so a studded belt doesn't fit into that category, and therefore this narrowed the definition of weapon. So um, it will only apply in fewer circumstances. So the interpretation of statutes can both broaden or narrow a law. Uh, another feature of the relationship is the ability of courts to influence Parliament. Um, and this is quite in-depth here, and it's because two of these points are also 
our next two um, features of the relationship. So we're getting those uh, in on those a little bit earlier. Um, essentially, the decision that a courts make, that courts make in different cases, um, can have an influence on uh, Parliament's lawmaking. So a really, really recent example for um, really recent example, for example, um, you might have seen some fuel recently around uh, the sentencing of uh, a couple of women who attacked an ambulance driver, um, and they were both sentenced uh, to community corrections orders, if I remember correctly. Um, this decision by the courts caused a bit of public uproar, and as a result, Parliament is looking to make some changes to the law in order to um, ensure that if you if you basically abuse an emergency service first responder, um, that you will go to prison. So that's, I suppose, a little bit of an example of um, a decision by the courts influencing Parliament, and what was seen as a negative decision. Um, but essentially, as I've just gone through there, sometimes Parliament will disagree with what the courts do, um, and as a result, they'll change or they'll pass legislation that makes sure that doesn't happen again or changes that interpretation. This is called abrogation, which we're going to look at in a minute and look at another example of. Um, the opposite of that is when Parliament actually agrees with the decision of the courts and decides that that law should be um, written out fully and protected um, from from being changed by more senior courts. So this is codification, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, but there's also this, um, so this is the example I just talked about, large public backlash over the, um, the sentencing of those uh, offenders who uh, bash the ambulance worker. But also sometimes if, even if they have to apply um, a precedent, judges might make open dictum statements, which are statements by the way, so parts of the judgment that aren't the ratio of decidendi, aren't the reasons for the decision. Um, and in these open dictum statements, they may express their disapproval of the law that they need to follow or apply, and that might be influential on Parliament actually changing the law. Um, so let's have a look at abrogation and codification in a little bit more detail. So literally just copy and pasted straight off that slide beforehand. The decision made by the court can be influential on Parliament in that Parliament might agree with the courts and therefore they might try and strengthen the common law and turn it into statute law. Now the prime example of this is the Marbo case and the development of native title um, based on the case that Eddie Marbo um, brought to seek native title over the island of Mer, um, which is pictured here, Murray Island. Um, in this example, um, we know that the High Court uh, agreed with um, Eddie Marbo's legal team and their argument that Australia was not terra nullius when um, Britain arrived in 1788 with um, the first fleet, and therefore there was such a thing as native title um, that Indigenous Australians did have possession of the land. But what this meant was that developed or established a precedent, a new precedent that native title exists. But what would have had to happen is that any Indigenous group who wanted them to seek native title over um, their land and where they lived um, would have had to pursue legal action through the courts. Um, yes, there was a precedent that native title exists, but it was quite um, narrow in terms of you had to have proof of um, or be able to show that you did have a system of land ownership, etc. Um, so it was basically going to be um, a massive shit show of trying to, to use the courts to prove that you had native title over an area of land. Um, the Australian government at the time thought, you know what, it would be better and it is the right thing to do for us to actually just come up with a law and they wrote out, um, they wrote up the Native Title Act that actually regulates how this works. What is native title? Who is eligible for it? And how you seek to get native title? So now rather than going to the courts um, every time an Indigenous group wants to put in a native title claim, um, there was the development of a native title tribunal um, and a set of definitions around 
how you establish and prove native title um, and what you are therefore entitled to, but also what extinguishes native title. So um, ensuring in a way that um, you know society would be able to continue on as it was and people wouldn't be losing their house or their business, etc. cetera. Um, so what extinguished native title was also enumerated out in the Native Title Act. So this is an example of Parliament looking at a court's decision and saying, yep, sweet, we agree, we think that's the right decision and we're gonna um, write out a statute law to regulate this and make it easier in the future. Parliament also had the option in that case though to abrogate. And abrogation is when Parliament disagrees with the decision made by the court. So if Parliament chose to abrogate um, the Marbo case and abrogate native title, they could have passed a law that basically said there is no such thing as native title or passed a law that said all native title um, is extinguished. So Parliament has the ability to do that. Um, an example of where they actually did disagree with the courts was in this famous case called the Trigwell case. And this is from the, uh, I think from the 70s in South Australia. Um, basically it ended up getting appealed up to the High Court and really simply, and it's much more complex than this, but um, the crux of it is uh, a sheep had wandered onto the road and caused an accident um, through some insurance companies and all that getting involved. Um, there ended up being a, basically the question the High Court had to answer was, should the livestock owner be responsible for the accident and the damage caused? because it was their sheep that was on the road. Um, the High Court went back to a, a, an old precedent from um, England about liability for stock owners. So this question had been answered in a, in a case over there. And that precedent said that stock owners should not be liable for any damage their stock cause um, if they get out of the fences. So they applied this um, judicial conservatism at play um, you know, didn't see it was their role to change the law, that that was Parliament's role. Um, and there was a bit of a public like, ooh, not a big fan of that decision. Um, so Parliament subsequently passed a law that makes stock owners liable for damage their stock cause. So the idea being that if you are a stock owner, it is your responsibility to make sure that your fences are, um, are working and not broken and, and, and you know, maintenance is, is done on them so that because I should say if your stock do get out and cause an accident you will be liable um, but in the true case case um, that wasn't uh, wasn't the situation and the High Court decided to follow that outdated precedent. Our skill here is to analyze the features of the relationship and now this is a really interesting use of the word analyze um, Analyze is often used, it effectively means to look deeply at something. And in legal studies, analyze is often used to mean that you need to, to look at the two sides of something. So look at the strengths and weaknesses or look at the impact or the not, you know, not having the impact. In this case, I think, and it used analyze in the old study design. And the sort of questions we got, I think, like I said earlier, are gonna be things like little case studies or little scenarios that just ask you to apply your understanding of how the courts and Parliament work together. And an example of this was from the uh, 2013 legal studies exam. A legal critic once said, Parliament cannot make laws that override decisions made by the Supreme Court of Victoria. Is this statement correct or incorrect? Explain your answer for three marks. And obviously here you're explaining that, well, yes, Parliament can override decisions made by the Supreme Court of Victoria because Parliament is the supreme law making body in its jurisdiction. Um, as we can see, out of three marks, the average is only 1.4. So it's actually a good opportunity, um, this sort of content, to get a little bit of a leg up on other people. So we see here the sample answer, this is incorrect. Parliament is our supreme lawmaking body because of its supremacy in lawmaking. If the Supreme Court has made a decision which then becomes precedent for future cases and Parliament does not agree with it, it can make law which abrogates that precedent. So great use of legal vocab there. And um, it has the example of the Trigwell case, um, amending the Wrongs Act to make owners of animals liable for the animal's action. So um, you can see here for three marks, to gain full marks, 
Students need to make reference to the point that Parliament is our supreme lawmaking body and can therefore abrogate common law. So using those two features of a relationship to bulk out your answer um, and using examples will help get full marks there. Um, there's a really in-depth look at the relationship between courts and parliament that you can find on the Australian Parliament House website. Um, it's quite high level, but it is worth a read if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and we've got another Engage Wiki link to the old study design, another video on this relationship between courts and parliament. Um, hopefully at the end of that, you can answer our essential question of what is the relationship between parliament and the courts in lawmaking um, by reference to these five points. Um, hopefully uh, you are tracking along through area 4.2 and um, already starting to do a little bit of exam revision as well. So I'd recommend you starting to look back at some practice questions from 3.1 and 3.2 particularly, um, just to try and get a bit of a head start and try and break up your study a bit. Um, hopefully you got through this in one piece, um, a little bit of a rambling one tonight I feel like, but um, nonetheless, we are working our way through and are nearly done for the year. So make sure you subscribe, um, leave feedback, comments, all that sort of stuff. And um, we'll be back to you back soon with 4.2.6.